So welcome to this edition of the Tux Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Johan Lilius, and uh, today we have a very interesting talk by Christian Fredriksson, who is the president and CEO of F-Secure. Uh, Christian is, has an interesting career also because he's originally from uh, COTF, chemical engineering, but he has actually done his whole career in, in the IT industry. And uh, the, the other reason why I think this is a very uh, in interesting talk is that uh, lately we have been hearing a lot about all kinds of uh, security breaches. There was discussions about NSA. And then you read these small, no small notices and the news about uh, this and that uh, weird uh, virus has, having been detected. Like there was this one now that had, uh, had been infiltrated into hard drives. So, so this uh, area of cybersecurity is really uh, becoming a kind of arms race uh, between sort of call it law enforcement and, let's say, the criminals or whatever. And interestingly, uh, we also have a lot of uh, companies in the trenches uh, in, in this situation, in the front line, and, and this is what we will hear about today. So please. Yes. Let's see if I get this working. Can you hear me? Is this a good? This is good. All right. Good to be here, and uh, thanks for joining. I'm going to take you on a tour into cybersecurity, the life we live. It's a phenomenal industry. It's never boring. Uh, let me start with a video. I'm going to talk a lot about trust today, because this business is like most of businesses at the end of it. This is about trust. So who do you trust? And of course, I'm going to try to prove why you can trust us. And uh, we'll see if you agree on that. But let's start uh, uh, with a video for you from, from uh, I'll explain this later a bit. In 2007, cyber criminals developed an incredibly effective Trojan called Zeus, often used to steal banking information. The program's effectiveness quickly attracted attention from law enforcement agencies around the world. And in an act of self-preservation, the author of Zeus released the blueprints of the Trojan on the web in 2010, making it available for other criminals to use and develop new strains of malware. The most successful new strain emerged in 2011, when Russian hacker Evgeny Bogachev allegedly authored and implanted the Game Over Zeus Trojan on computers all around the world building a network of infected machines, or bots, that his crime syndicate could control from anywhere. Unlike its predecessor, the Game Over Zeus botnet has a peer-to-peer -peer architecture, making it much more difficult for security experts and law enforcement agencies to dismantle the network. Game Over Zeus is designed to capture banking credentials from infected computers and make wire transfers to criminal accounts overseas. Bogachev? Commit cyber crimes across the globe with the stroke of a key and the click of a mouse. Game Over Zeus is the most sophisticated and damaging botnet we have ever encountered. However, Game Over Zeus is also a platform that other criminals can load different Trojans onto. One such Trojan is CryptoLocker, a devastating malware that locks a user's most precious files until he or she pays a ransom. Bogachev is believed to operate both of these Trojans, doubling his revenue streams. Losses attributed to Game Over Zeus are estimated at more than $100 million. In June 2014, the world's top government agencies on organized crime collaborated under Operation Tovar to fight the Trojan. The FBI, Interpol, Europol, and the UK's National Crime Agency obtained court approval to redirect the botnet communications away from the malicious servers operated by the Game Over Zeus criminals. But the mission is far from over. These servers are just part of the equation. Right now, the Trojan is in remission, but Bogachev is hiding out in Russia, and there's a chance he could reactivate the remaining bots at any time by reestablishing a connection to any infected machine and sending new commands. There is something you can do to help in the fight for digital freedom. Have an internet security solution and keep it up to date. Keep your Windows operating system and your internet browser plugins updated. Back up all of your personal files regularly. Also, check your machines to be sure you do not carry the Game Over Zeus Trojan. 
If we clean every infected computer, the game over Zeus network will lose power, and Bogachev's army of bots will be depleted. All right. That was uh, one example. One example I'll talk a little about when it comes to cybersecurity and uh, cybercrime. That was one example where our labs people were involved in investigation and locating the criminals. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that as well because that shows you a bit of different kind of work that we do because we defend and we block, but we also support in some cases in finding at the people. We don't do the physical acts of collecting. That's out down to the police forces. But we, of course, also help. So we do help out also in investigations. It's a fine line, of course, for a cybersecurity company. As a company, we have only one task, which is to, co which is to protect our customers. And we have only one question, which we ask. Would you like this piece of malware or software running on your machine or your device? If the answer is no, we block it or we clean it or we take it away. Whether it's from a government, whether it's from police force, criminals or any other agencies. Or, as I'm going to explain to you, the third, there are two other groups in this game nowadays, which is then either commercial companies and the fourth one, which is a new one, is the terrorist organizations. Those are probably the four groups that we see. But did you know that the most common place to encounter crime nowadays is online? Very few people know that. That's where you encounter crime. Unfortunately, in this world, as we connect more and more of the world, in those countries where there is lack of education or jobs or lack of opportunities for young people, young, clever people, it's so easy to get into cybercrime because that might be the other outcome, only outcome you have. So when we keep on adding people to the Internet and we, when we are now adding, for example, more of Africa into the Internet, that's why, of course, all the time when we go more and more into Eastern Europe, more and more into, into Asia, more and more into Africa, of course, you will also get more and more cyber attacks. Because there is one fundamental, one big fundamental difference in this business compared to, for example, if you look at military forces. You can't copy a U-boat, or you can't easily copy at least nuclear weapons. But in this business, a 15-year-old kid can have at his disposal something developed over a year by a government, hundreds of millions into a malware, is in the hands of a 15-year-old kid because he can copy it from the web. It's for sale on the web. You actually even get customer support when you go there. They will help you out. You get translation. You get, you know, I want Nordea's bank translated for me. So you get consultancy, and they'll do it for you. And you can even have a, have a num number, toll-free number, where you can check, you know, did you get it right? Is the wording correct? So it's a whole different world out there. That's why this... It's a fascinating battle that we do. It's like ping pong, like judo, digital judo on the net that we are doing in the web for us. I'm going to talk a little bit about this. By the way, does everybody know Edward Snowden? Hands up if you have heard of him. Okay. In some places, people haven't still. Probably one of the most fastest recognized faces in the industry. Some people think he's a villain. Some think people think he's a hero. I suppose we don't really know yet. Uh, but for sure, he did a very brave thing from our perspective. And he also did a quite embarrassing thing for the whole uh, se in security industry. Because he revealed how little we also knew from how far the governments have gone when it comes to cyber espionage and the capabilities they have built in this business. Our engineers are fascinated by the extreme competence and development capabilities that they have had when they built this new malware and the attacking capabilities of the governments. But it's hardly a surprise if you look at, you, don't know, you only need to go to uh, China, Russia, Israel, 
U.S., to name a few of the big ones. And you go and take a look at their military or agency subcontractors. And it's open on the web on the job applications that those subcontractors are having. And it is thousands of jobs that are open. And they're looking for people with capabilities to hack Android phones, hack iOS phones, building malware that is capable of hiding for long periods of time. That's what the capabilities they're looking for, for different operating systems and for different uh, devices. And it's a very interesting job description when you look at the on the web. So, you, you know, you shouldn't be hardly surprised on what's going on in the government part. Now, I'll talk about the different, uh, I'll give you these four different groups. So I thought I'll give you an example so you get a view of, of what they are because people read a lot about this. There's a lot of articles about it. So I'll group them in four different areas about what kind of uh, life we live. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we are doing about it from our point of view and as an industry as well. And there's a lot you can do also when you go out there. But the first thing is, of course, to understand what's happening, but not be scared about it. Uh, it's nothing to be scared about. And I think that uh, I've been, I was a bit more pessimistic a while ago because uh, I thought that uh, in the worst case scenario, if all of this goes really bad, we could kill the internet. Because if, it, that, if that trust is gone and it becomes the biggest espionage and crime tool ever invented, obviously it's a total disaster and a total failure by companies like us to be able to actually drive it so that it's safe to use. But you also carry a responsibility and just close an eye and think it has nothing to do with me. Or I have nothing to hide which is so typically used, right? Which is also totally wrong. To state that means you haven't really thought about it. I believe that the essence of democracy, the essence of free speech, actually requires that you answer that differently. Because you're turning the whole point around as if you would be suddenly in a court of law, you have to show that you have nothing to hide instead of being guilty. It's a big change that if we would accept that. And I guarantee you, if we would check over all of your years, everything you do, everything you click, everything you write, everything you talk, if we record everything about you all of your life, I guarantee you, you have a lot to hide. I guarantee you that. Not a single person on this earth is so clean that they have nothing to hide. And at least it can be extremely embarrassing if you ever seek public office. And somebody who has that information has got your grip. And then you're jeopardizing democracy. So it's not a small thing that we're talking about, actually. But let me go through the four groupings, because it's nothing to be scared about either. Just knowing what it is, because we can battle it as well. I'll talk about a little bit about the four groupings in the cybersecurity. One is the governmentals, what's going on from the governments. Some of it you know. I'll talk a little bit about the criminals. You saw Game of Azeus, which was the name of the gang, with Bogachev as the leader, which is many, many of these gangs that we are encountering all around the world all the time when we drive our cybersecurity from our labs. And then I'll talk a little bit about commercial companies, where because we have very bad legislation in the digital world, companies misuse it. And how many of you, when it comes to commercial, have read all of the pages of even one of the apps when you wrote them for free on your devices? How many times have you read the terms and conditions through of what you accept when you push the button. Has anybody ever read it? All through. I've read through a couple of them, and it takes, you know, if you want to fall asleep, it's a good exercise. And you give everything away. I'll give you a few examples of that. And it should not be on the consumer to carry that, because it's too much. 
it's too much to read, too much to understand, too complex. So we as an industry also need to regulate ourselves a bit on that. And then I'll talk, although it's a small portion, I won't spend much time on that, is the, is the terrorist group, which is the fourth, fourth grouping, which is also looking for sponsors. It's a way for them to sponsor their, their unfortunate activities. So we see, and we have seen for the first time, the level of sophistication rising even in that camp. The first ways of making money from the terrorist groups, such as ISIS. So let me start with the governments. They are doing many things on the web, as you know, and I'll show you a few of them. Where there is law enforcement, which is good, it is to protect all of us, and it's needed. And that's what I gave you an example where we help out as well. It's an important part of our job, what we do in the industry. Then there's the espionage, which has been done all through history, right? Espionage is one very, very old way of gathering information as well as surveillance. And we've seen the first sabotages now. Even the first physical sabotage, where, we actually are, where, where you actually, with piece of software, which we didn't think would be possible a few years ago still, that you would actually, uh, one government would destroy physically something in another government's uh, uh, passion. That we didn't believe before. It's like a James Bond movie almost, that you can do that. But that's where we are, that it, those capabilities exist and they have been used, such as the nuclear power plant in Iran, as some of you know as well, right? That's the first example of physically destroying things. And of course, warfare, cybersecurity is, is a big portion of all, I think, warfare plans as of today, right? In terms of how do you cause blackout, how do you do whatever. It's part of it. And what's in the grid and what's not in the grid. But let me give you an example. Regin. We encountered the first, just to give you the level of sophistication, I find it fascinating how fast this industry has evolved. We found this is actually the file header of Regin. This is how it looks, the file header, when you open up the, the malware. This is a modular malware, which destroys itself. It's an incredibly advanced. Hundreds of people have made it. We are sure it's with the uh, UK and NSA, right, that have done this. Extremely powerful tool that was used a lot in the Middle East to find out things. It's been spreading well. It's so modular, so it's almost like finding pieces of bones of a historical, prehistorical dinosaur when we gather this together. We found the first modules in 2009, and we keep finding modules of it here and there. When we get, we get 300,000 samples a day into our cloud security system, we get 5 billion pings a day, requests for check per day. 5 billion. So we gather quite a lot of stuff every day around what's going on in the cybersecurity space every year. And this is something that it's like a forensic work that you keep doing over years when you suddenly start to see after a while that this is a dinosaur of this size, of these ways, and of these capabilities. An incredibly well done program, I have to say. Take my, we take our hat off for the capabilities some of the governments have done for themselves. The unfortunate part is that when these modules are out there, then of course they are in the hands of criminal gangs as well, as I explained to you, why this industry is so different. Beautiful piece of software in many other places, but it's of course gathering information. It's at the hands of the command of anybody who is behind it. Can send commands, control anything of any of the devices where it spreads, and they can ca gather any information and they can put any information back as they wish, right? And as I said, it destroys itself so that it's very hard to do forensics. It's a very, very capable piece of malware. Now, this is, of course, on the company side day. On one thing on this one was interesting, of course, that uh, this was the, I'll take the biggest example from last year, so which you've heard about probably Sony Pictures which was devastating because that's, that's one of the first time where all of the information of one company is published on the net. HR information, salary information, leaders' email information. I'm getting more cautious myself as well that, you know, 
what do you say in an email nowadays? You should think about that this might be public all of it one day, right? And uh, of course, all their new movies, digital movies published, a lot of damage done to Sony Pictures, as you know. We have many of these examples which we investigate and which we work with, which we can't even tell. We have even cases where we, where we can see, because our software is used in many places, and we know when somebody is trying to attack our software. We know when somebody is tampering it to find a way. So when our latest release goes out, some agencies take it, and then they start to bombard it to find a hole of some kind, of some way around, and then they immediately go and attack. So we, we have you know, cases where both the attacker and the attackee are our customers. Interesting situations for companies to see when you realize that, wait a minute, this is going on between governments. And that is the incredible life of the sophistication of the internet, right? This was an interesting thing when, when, the, when the claim is that North Korea would, of course, be behind it for, for the nice movie that was published at the time. And uh, we actually thought, first reaction was that it couldn't be. It could not be North Korea. Because FBI told the name of that it's North Korea so fast after the incident happened. And we know from forensics, you're not going to be able to establish so fast who it was because it takes a lot of work because everybody knows how to hide. It's not so that because you find a little bit of Chinese piece of words in the, in the malware that it's Chinese. That's kind of any, any 15 year old kid knows how to put some Chinese stuff into it so it looks Chinese, right? And so you need to do much, much deeper forensics. But then actually what came out was that the FBI stated that they, they actually knew it's North Korea because they hacked North Korea several years ago. So they've been in there all the time. So it's an interesting case of a government blaming another against for hacking when they actually hacked them already a long, long time ago. That's where we are. I'll give you another example. In the Hong Kong, we see many things. We see attacks because of the systems that we have. We see what's going on in different parts of the world. We saw a huge increase in malware after the, after, after the situation that happened in Ukraine, we see the attacks increasing in all around that space, built for that area, built for those capabilities. Obviously, from the Russian side and from the other sides, right? We also saw in Hong Kong, when you had this umbrella and the, and the demonstration going on, there was a lot of malware that came out there that comes in, spreads through the phones, so that you actually know who is where at what point of time, and gathering into what situation. Once again, is it so that all information is innocent? Is it so that no information has anything to do with it? So basically, anybody who gathered around those space with a mobile phone, they were being tracked at the same time. So they wanted to know who is gathering around certain spaces at about certain time. Now, you can try to guess who's put that malware out there. And when you do this, you realize all around the world how systematic this is now. We didn't, that's another thing we didn't think a few years ago. Not only that we do physical damage with malware, but actually that you would in mass, a government would in mass build malware to attack their own citizens. That we didn't see either. Once again, like a James Bond movie of how this world has changed, right? I talked about... Uh, Criminals a bit. I showed you the video on Bogachev, and uh, that was an interesting case for, for us, of course, because we helped. This is where I think a lot of good things can happen with cybersecurity companies working together with uh, governments like Interpol. We only work with when it law enforcement agencies, of course, when they ask for support, and when there's a court order behind it, and when there's an investigation going on, and then our guys help them actually find, uh, locate who they are and where they are. And it's a big job. It's not an easy thing. These people are very good at hiding. Very, very good. It's going to take a long time to track them down where they are. It takes a lot of effort from the agencies as well. Bogachev has said he's not being found, but we got several of his gang members were found. Now, then we come to the commercial part. 
this is an interesting because this is moving so fast, so we have even our part of challenges to hang on to it. So I talked a little bit about the governments, what's going on, the sophistication level. Criminals, the criminals we understand, we know how to play. I believe that we can and we, we feel that we can handle that judo. I'll give an example of what we can do and how we have developed our heuristic systems, our automated systems. So for example, we have this, used to have this onslaught of attacks. So there's, a, there's in this business, we call it the, the malware and we'll call it the APT, advanced, advanced persistent threat. So malware, when I do, as Bogachev and the gang, the Game Over Zeus gang was doing, I just, I just launch it at all of you. I don't care who of you I get, it doesn't matter. I get a million of you and I can use that information. I can use your credit cards. And believe me, if I get your credit cards, these are really, really smart, these guys. When I get your credit card, I'll make money out of it. People are so naive. They think I can make money because, of course, I can see it on my slip and then I know who bought it. Come on. It's so easy. If we get the credit card numbers, they are so good at it, right? So you employ, you employ people on the internet. So a lot of people, let's say, I'll give you an example which we found out, right? So people, I'll get, I get a thousand credit card. How can I turn that to money? Because if I buy something, I'll do it for a while, right? I buy with a thousand credit card, but then you'll get to me because the police will know who I am because, and where I am. It's not that easy. When you start thinking about it, if you got hours and hours per day to think about how to use it, you'll figure out ways. You can employ people on the internet. I'll give you an example. I'll order 1,000 iPhones because I got all your credit card numbers. I'll order 1,000 iPhones from a company which I've established on the internet in Poland. And this is a real case. Then I'll employ some 80-year-old grandmas, a few of them, in that same village. And they'll happily take a job. And their only job is to take to actually take those iPhones and have them. And then I'll order a new chauffeurs through the internet who go and pick up those iPhones every week. And they drive them over the border. And then there's a gang who takes it from there. So when the police force comes with our help, for example, we'll get these 80 year old ladies and we'll get some 60 year old drivers who are employed from the internet who actually haven't really stolen anything. And the phones are gone, money turned beautifully and easily away. There are thousands of these ways that they use. So brilliant, so easy, so fast. And then we always end up with these ADR people, which we then have, which is not, of course, what do you do? You can't put them to jail, of course. They have done nothing wrong, really. I mean, they're in all, all good faith. They thought they were part of a transportation company working for it. So fascinating in this business. So I'll talk a little bit about the a little bit more on how the Wi-Fi experiment and what we did in this one. Because the commercial companies are different, of course. That legislation is living very fast. It's a fascinating world, and you are clicking, and, add, and you're taking these terms and conditions, you're allowing it for yourself, right? You're all taking apps, right? There are no free apps. You should know that. There are no free apps. You are the product. You're not the customer anymore. When you, take a terms, when you actually take an app of any kind and it's free and you take it to your device, you have changed from being a customer to being the product. You're being sold now. And uh, that information is so valuable that you have companies like Google and Facebook and others who are, you're not paying them anything, but they're making $12 profit every year on each, when, each one of you. Isn't that fascinating? How can they make profit on you? You're not paying them anything. And they're not. They're a good company, right? They're just using a business model which is available, which is beautiful, actually. And it's great. We just need to understand what we do and what we don't in the web. So we did this Wi-Fi experiment just to demonstrate how easy this is. We did, we did this together with Interpol and, and Europol in the UK. Because we don't want to do anything which would jeopardize our reputation and anybody thinking that we're actually hacking, which we are not. We are extremely sensitive about that. But we did this together with the agencies and the police forces. 
200 euros to go to a shop and buy a Wi-Fi box. Then you go with that box. We went to any seminar, any place like this school, any cafeteria, and you go and sit down and you put it on and you name it something which sounds a little bit like this place where you are. Coffee bean, a coffee bean. Telecommunication seminar, telecommunication seminar, free Wi-Fi. Bo Academy or Bo Academy free Wi-Fi. I mean, you don't have to be very smart to figure out. And within seconds, people start to log on. Within seconds, they start to log on. And when you do that, I got you. I got you. I got your passwords. I got your traffic. I got your user IDs. I got everything. I can go to your email and I can see what you've been buying. I can see your history and records and I'll go to a web page. Maybe I go to Amazon and, and because, you know, forgot password. So I click forgot password and you get an email, but I'm in your email now, so I, of course, get that info and I can do what I wish. Now, on top of it, what we did with the terms and conditions here was uh, we actually put some funny terms and conditions in there just to check this. And I'm, thanks, I'm thankful you were honest. Nobody actually read that they read the term con terms and conditions. And I, I probably wouldn't read them either if I wouldn't be in this business. And I read them only out of curiosity. And uh, by the way, did you know terms and conditions? Apple has a term condition which says you're, you're not allowed to use Apple in any kind of weapon. You know, there is all kind of... And, and uh, we've seen these pictures of terrorists who are using granite launchers and then they use it for kind of looking at the angles, you know, where, because you have, the, you have the capability to look at like a compass and angles, so you see people using it as an angle calculator, which is, of course... Not right, because you shouldn't use it like that, because it specifically states that you shouldn't use it. I'm very disappointed at that. We put in these terms and conditions that you are not, or when you take this free Wi-Fi, you accept at the same time that you will give away your first point child to us. And everybody clicked yes, you know, fully accept, everybody's on. Which is, of course, not, that's part of the thing, right, that it actually shows you that, which we all knew anyhow. It wasn't a big surprise that we click accept. And I'm not, what I'm advocating for in the industry, as of course, is not for us to start. We can't write these 50 pages of terms and conditions. I mean, nobody's going to read them. We have to kind of put the pr basics of it, what the privacy is. And uh, we've done a lot on this one. We have a product called F-Secure Freedom, which encrypts your data and actually makes you invisible or anonymous on the web. So we try to do these things that helps you to get some of your power back. We also have a free service, by the way, which we launch tomorrow. On you go our privacy page on F-Secure, you can check any device that you're using with when you go to there and click. And it will check your history and it will check your privacy settings. And it will check who is, what hooks you have on. So who is following you? This gives you that information. We wanted to give that transparency to you. So the device you're on, you go to that page on privacy, in our privacy page on F-Secure. You go there, you click on it, and you'll find out who is hooked into you. Might be interesting pages that are hooking into you, which means that they record what you do. Now, why would anybody record what you do? Of course, you can sell the information. I'll give you another. Do you know dynamic pricing? Internet is a fabulous place, right? Dyna dynamic pricing. Maybe you've experienced some of this. You might go to an airline or some other web page to buy tickets. It might be from here to Brussels, and it's 350 euro. Two days, you surf around, you check. Now, when you've been there, they hook into you, right? So when you go back, it's 450 euros. And you sit in a plane and wonder why is it half empty. Now you've experienced dynamic pricing because they've seen you've been where you've been, they've seen what you've done, and they realized you didn't find any other prices, so now your price went up. You are personally going to get a different price than anybody else who comes to that website. So information is power. So when you accept something for free and it uses your information, you might pay it in many, many different ways, and none of them you could experience or even think about when you go out there. 
And that's why I think that we have an internet, we have to kind of get a little bit back of the trust of the internet as well, and we're working with that. And I know many companies are doing a lot for it. Many companies are doing a lot. They're showing what the privacy apps are. They, they're telling you that you have to accept cookies and, and so forth. So you can see that that is coming, and I think that that's part of the work we're doing so that it becomes more transparent. It's okay. Many of the stuff and many of the information is good. It's for your benefit. It helps you. It's the brilliance of internet. We want that capability to be there. But it should be at the choice of the consumers and the companies. It should not be so that it's misused in any way and everybody just gathers information and doesn't tell them. And all your tracking data is somewhere in the cloud for anybody else to hack it. I'm not going to spend too much time on this one. We, we know probably the one reason why mobile malware is now rising. We talked about mobile malware as actually as an industry. I don't know how long. And it never came. <laughs> there wasn't anything. So I don't think anybody, people don't even know anybody who's been hacked on the mobile, really. It's been so little comparing to the millions and millions of hacks in the PC world and, and, and the whole uh, fixed world. Now we're seeing for the first time a huge increase in the mobile. And it's of course, two th there's two reasons. One is of course that the mobiles are now becoming computers. And there is a way of making money of anything that is a computer because of Bitcoin. You know Bitcoin mining, right? So that suddenly makes it so that I don't, ex I don't actually even, ha I, I just take your energy and a little bit of your devices running and I'll use that to translate to money. But the second thing is that now with this two-way authentication, which is coming from the banks, criminals are like anybody else. In you, know, you don't want to invest if it doesn't give you benefits. If the return on investment is not worth it, I don't go there. If I can hack the PC world, I'm not going to go to Mac because I can make plenty of money in the PC world. I don't have to use a lot more effort to get into the Mac world because it's an under our OS system, two software cases I have to run, I have to do maintenance on two of these, I have to keep on building them because they keep, everybody keeps on building walls, so I have to work on two. Now if I take mobile, that becomes another platform again. Every device has its own parts, right? So it's a lot of different malware to develop. But now, when the banks have gone for two-way authentication, now I can't make money anymore suddenly if I only have your PC or Mac. I need to get, I need to get your PC, Mac and your mobile phone. Because you're gonna get the SMS, right, which is checked, do you accept this transaction, right? Because of that two-way authentication, now the criminals go, wow, okay, now I gotta get into the mobile phone. And we see, of course, the uptake on mobiles are dramatic. Because business case that dictates, again, the behavior. And of course, because people surf much more on mobile devices. So obviously, then you're more prone and you start buying stuff on mobile devices. This is an interesting part where we're looking a lot into in the cyber because this is roughly that there's going to be 500 connected devices at your home by 2020. Think about it. And it's not your choice. Actually, you got, it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. I mean, maybe you don't want your fridge to be connected to the internet, but it's not going to be your choice. Anything you buy will be connected. Whether it's going to be the curtains, to your dishwasher, to your water, I don't know what. And it's not so that, I mean, nobody is interested in hacking your fridge, you know, to order extra milk to you and laugh about it. I mean, that's not like, yeah, that's a cool thing to do, right? Maybe some kid will do it just for the fun of it, but that's not, of course, not the main purpose. Anything with computing power becomes interesting because of kit, uh, Bitcoin. If I get millions of devices... And many of these, you know, surveillance cameras at homes, etc. They, they are servers. They're running on mini servers. TVs, a lot of them have, have huge capacity in them built in. So when you take them, you can actually start mining bitcoins. You can make money out of that. And the only thing you'll notice is that the device is a bit hot and seems to consume a lot of energy. And it's running hot all the time. And, uh, but of course, this is, opens up and... and uh, we're looking a lot, how, how do we solve this? Because obviously no person is going to dare start installing something into every device. We take an average 
mother in a family, I mean, how much are they going to be interested in taking all these devices and trying to secure them one by one? Not a chance ever. Neither will any of the device manufacturers be good enough to actually build that security into it that it will work because it's going to be probably old when it comes there. So it has to be done from the cloud. It has to be done so that we protect the whole household and we make it easy. That's what we want to solve, and I find that that's a fantastic dilemma and an engineering beautiful, beautiful problem to solve. That's why we invest a lot into it. We want to find that solution. And I think those are the kind of things that makes our engineering tick, right? How can we solve stuff like this so that it makes sense for the consumer, so it makes sense for you, so you don't have to worry, but they're still protected. And from the angle that makes, make, makes sense for the home, of course. As I said, I, I don't believe, you, don't, you know, of course, cars get interesting. And some of the devices in the home get interesting, but I don't think a, a regular toaster is going to be hacked, you know, because somebody wants to burn your bread, you know, that's not, that's not the case. So I don't think that's a big worry for anybody, but there are other parts which are interesting from the home. You know, of course, now that there is, if you look at the, the TV manufacturers, uh, they already have in the terms and conditions, which you never read, uh, but there you have actually a statement already that be, be aware that this is a two-way channel now. If you read them, it's going to be so. They warned you, but you never read that anyhow. But that means that, of course, if we want to hack, and how many of people will change the passwords? Well, none of them, of course, will change the password of the TV. So, you know, if you want to get in and watch, I don't know if anybody's so interested to watch what, how you look when you watch your TV, but it's possible to listen and see what's happening there. But some individuals, because targeted attacks are interesting, right? So some individuals, not the masses, but some individuals might be interesting to see what discussion going on, at least, if nothing else, to embarrass them. Now we have this... Uh, there was an interesting thing, I'll, I'll ex I, I explain this one. There was a guy who did an interesting experiment. You can actually run a check on everything that's connected to the internet. It's very easy to do. So he actually, what he did was that he ran, he put an own website up, and he ran through everything that is connected on the internet in this whole world. Billions and billions of devices of all kinds. And then every... Every time his machines found something where, you know, he tried the really difficult passwords like zero, four zeros, one, two, three, four, you know, TV, this kind of password the machine was trying automatically. And then he opened up them on the internet. You can go on the web page and see. And, you know, he, he had, uh, he got home, he got into home's curtain system so he could put the <laughs> curtains back and forth. He got into factories, automated systems. So he could put the factory off and on. He got into power grid systems. He got into an amazing amount of systems all around the world when he just kept doing that. So it was, it was a very good wake-up call as well to, for many to, to do so. So when you go to his web page, I think he found a lot of systems that were just easily, just even trying anything. So this is some of it is, of course, where hackers take control now. Here you see some of the news with these 300,000 home routers. This is a typical case where, of course, Bitcoin, that's what you wanted. Nobody cares really about maybe the home router, but it gives you a lot of, a lot of angle. Either Bitcoin or you can do DDoS attacks. You can do bot attacks with that, right? So I can attack if I take all the routers here. And that's why we had a router check, also a free check for us on our web. You go to router check, you can check your home router. That has it been hacked. Because not what, now what the criminals do or the hackers do when you saw the banks or you see some of these web pages go down every now and then is, of course, that if I take control of 300,000 Finnish routers, many of them might be yours. So if you have that at home, I'm not using it in any way to harm you, but I'm using that router as a command chain to go to Nordea's page or somebody else's page and I, I collapse them, right, just for the fun of it or actually to make, make a statement. So that's why you can also check the router, that is it actually in your command or is it somebody else's command? And is your traffic going the way it's supposed to go? You go on that, check the router. If you go on the FCQ web page, it's an interesting thing to do. When you go home, go to check, your, check the router. We have that. It's a free check. There's one button. You push it, and it's going to sh check for you who is controlling the router, if it is the one that is said to be 
it's, it's designed there if it's ELISA or something else, right? So it checks that it's in the right hands and the traffic doesn't go to China or somewhere else, right? And you will get a green light if it's okay. Interesting ways. We believe very strongly as a company, and I believe very strongly as a person when I get to, to the end of it, that with all this that is going on, we can retain the freedom of internet. Even if I'm actually a little bit more optimistic now than I was a while ago. Because people have woken up. Because companies are trying to do better. Because there is at least a discussion on legislation. Because there are certain signs that we're starting to encrypt more data. People are starting to wake up, do the basic things right. There are so many easy things that you can do to protect yourself as well. Just be aware of them, right? And you can do a lot of it also. We also, the companies, of course, interesting enough because the growth in the, com in the corporate side in this business is immense because of now the IT budgets are rising. This is still a business where there is a before and an after attack. And uh, you can imagine what the, pro what, the, what the guys or any CXO of any company would pay once it hits the fan for a corporation to be there. It's an interesting situation, right? So there's always, so it's not really bad. It's not going to happen. And once it happens and it hits your company, then the cost of cleaning up, the cost of finding, and the cost lost of data is incredible. Ransomware is very high up now on the, when it comes to, of course, attacks. We even had one of the police forces whose system got hacked. And they got ransomed, and they actually couldn't get access to any of their data anymore. So even they had to pay for it, which was slightly embarrassing. And, and uh, they were really angry about it because we couldn't open up. We couldn't open up. So when you know, ransomware comes in, into your systems, and it just crypts everything. It's embarrassing when the police force system gets encrypted. You know, it's like, crap, that's not good. And uh, I'm not going to tell who. <laughs> and anyhow, that's... Just the level of uh, where, you know, having backups and not having backups which are connected to the system that you have, for example. So it's very simple things where you can actually make sure that you're okay. And, and you don't get hit by the easiest of ways. And, and uh, not a big effort to do, but most people don't do even that. But on the digital privacy, we feel very strongly that this is, I have to say that when you fight for this, I think as a company, this is where you come into the question of who do you trust? That's kind of the main topic that we face all the time. Because if you're going to find, if you're going to take a security software into any of your devices, it is letting that company and that software under your OS. It gets access to everything. It's the most holy thing of peace that you put there. And I still see people taking free security software. When they will sell your information, it just astonishes me. It just blows me away. I mean, somebody is... And, and, and uh, you know, if you want to do real high-level security software, do you want to have an average guy doing that, or do you want the best of the world? Who do you think is better at protecting you? So if you take free security software, it's like, you know, it it's just amazes me all the time that people don't think, right? They don't think. So you have a security supplier who's actually selling your stuff. Wait a minute, that's a bit contradicting in a way. At least they should be transparent about what they sell. So we believe this makes a lot, and this business is about trust. I'll show you this. So who do you trust? This is, of course, where F-Secure comes in, and, and I thought about this, actually, because the fact is this. We are a commercial company. I am the CEO of a stock exchange company. So I can't claim that I'm holier than the Pope, because we need to do profit at the end of it. And there is no denying that. So you kind of think about how far do you want to push this. And I'm not trying to say that because there are many, many good companies in this industry. Extremely good, strong, ethical companies. But not all are. 
So I put ourselves here, right? That's all of us in the same gang. And we, we thought that, so how do we different as a company in this space, right, where you got all, you know, you got US, you got all kind of Russia, China, UK, and we put Finland in there. And, and uh, there are many great, there is one thing, because there's one thing which is big difference for us. Even, one, there's two things that favors us, which is actually unfair. It's an unfair competitive edge because it's not that the companies are bad who are in these countries. No, they're good companies. All of them are trying to do their best for their consumers. We have two things which are an unfair competitive advantage for us. There are many things that are in favor of the others as well, but two things help us. One is we have the strongest privacy laws in this country. The strongest, together with Germany probably, in the world. That means that, and it's not only that the privacy laws are the strongest in the, in, in the world, but you can look up a few things. Where are we as a nation when it comes to corruption, education, and when it comes to trust as, as part of the country? So you can always claim that you got a great legacy, but get great legislation and privacy respect, but if you're a dictatorship, it kind of limps a bit, that story. To be honest, it limps a bit. So I think that we speak with high integrity when we state that. The second thing we got, which is in a way a bad thing, of course, is it's a small nation, a small country, so we don't have a huge attack force in cybersecurity. And uh, that, of course, helps us being small. And it's a, it's, it's a disadvantage for the guys who are coming from big countries where the states are very big sponsors of cybersecurity attacks and driving it, of course, because their situation is very different in terms of what, the way those nations are. Nothing wrong with the companies again, but it gives us a bit of a benefit for us. So to, fi to finish off, we believe that it matters who do you trust. And we don't claim to be holier than the Pope. And I am very aware of the fact that I'm running a commercial company but we do feel that we have an ethical edge to anybody else in the industry. So if you can't trust us, who do you trust in this industry? And you should at least think about it. Who do you trust with the holiest of your information? But at the end of it, this industry is run by capabilities. And I think that's one thing which we say that we are, we are a 27-year-old company even before the first viruses were discovered, we were in this. We found the first virus. We were part of that world. And we're still here. So a strong integrity of this company. I'm very proud to work for this and proud of the integrity that we have. And we reveal what we get caught. We reveal when we do wrong as well, if, if somebody hacks our systems. We have invested a lot into cloud-based security. And I'll end with this one because I think this is an interesting part where you can actually, as an industry, you can use, when I talked about malware which attacks all of you, and APT, Advanced Persistent Threat, it comes specifically at you. It's specifically at you. It's a targeted attack. The interesting part of this is that you can actually, when you build heuristic systems, we can use that to shield you. Because if we have access to everything that goes around the world, and now your PC is opening up a file which has never been run in the world. So actually you turn the APT against itself. So we will block it just because nobody has ever run this program in the world. So unless you've done the program yourself, it's probably a targeted attack, right? Because the probability that you're going to be running somebody else's software for the only person in the whole world ever tried it is very, very small. So we can use that in a way with our systems. We can use it to also our benefit. So it's not a lost cause when you fight these targeted attacks either. But you just need to understand how to do it. And the artificial intelligence becomes very interesting here as well, which we, which we invest a lot into and which we are very interested in working on. That's a fascinating part of this industry as well because that's maybe the third benefit that we have is that we can solve things with a lot of people. 
we need to drive automation, we need to drive artificial intelligence, we need to drive heuristic capabilities to block and find and do forensics. We need to drive tools much further than anybody else. We need to have engineering capabilities much, much higher than anybody else to survive when we are not in a situation we can do just throw people at it. We fight for digital freedom. We're proud for it. We lost a bit of it. We lost a bit of steam when we realized how much has happened, and we had to gather a lot of attention and a lot of work. And we launched a lot of new products to make it possible to block, to have have you feel safe when you do your banking, and when you do your transactions, and when you surf and read your newspapers, and not feel that somebody is hacking me. So we done a lot to do that. I love this industry. We'll try to get as many good people to join. Somehow we always seem to be lacking of great talent in this industry. So that's why we also like to cooperate with universities to get more people. It's a hell of an industry. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for a very intriguing talk. Uh, I think there's time for a few questions. Let's take in the back. Uh, well, now with Windows XP, basically, I don't know what other words. First of all, the year has been basically malware is strongly being basically run on XP, which is before XP and during XP, it was not exactly made well for the security. Uh, so, how do you see that XP basically being phased out? Is, uh, how do you see that sort of like to, to your business? Yeah, so uh, the question was on XP, just so you hear it well. Uh, well. How do we see the XP, the attacks, and how do we see the impact in our business? I think XP has been, uh, I'm sure it's been a great, uh, a great money maker for, for many of the, the criminals. Yes, there's been a lot of hacks because, of course, XP has been a big base. And uh, we are still continue, we continue supporting XP, so I think we need to keep that growing. So I think from our point of view, there's new versions coming out. XP has been huge, and it's transforming to other versions in different phases. Right? So we haven't seen that it has a big difference because, of course, as a criminal and any hacker, if you want to get in business, you have to pass whatever comes out of the big OS organizations, operating systems first. Right? So, Typically, that means that we, we uh, in this business, tend to be in business. It just moves to other overseas. But I think we continue supporting XP, so it's, it's not, even if they have discontinued that kind of from, from uh, Windows uh, and Microsoft point of view, we're not, we're not leaving that. And I don't think anybody of the security suppliers is going to leave XP, at least the big ones are not leaving. So they're supporting it still. There would be too many holes otherwise. To Yeah. Okay. Just out of curiosity, are Mac users safer than PC and Windows? Yes. They are. Why? So you say because it's a smaller market or because it's a more exactly. better designed operating system? I think it's uh, two things. In a way, both of them. Now, first is, as I said, you know, when you when you put resources, you you will get through. Them. You need capabilities to stop that. So I think Mac has just been a small market share. And because, as I said, you know, you have a big market share here, uh, easier to attack, why would you put resources somewhere else? Right? And the second point has been that they have had a very close system, so that has helped them. So I, I think it's been very clear that, that helped the Apple closed system has helped them. But of course, we see now that you, the attacks are there as well, and you get through when, when you want to. So those are the two reasons I would say. So, but yes, it's been safe from that perspective. Uh, oh yes, spamming. Mean, uh, I think the biggest money making now, right, is in that ransomware. Uh, a ransomware is uh, clearly making a lot. Of the credit card thefts are still there. I think spamming is used as well. That's right. It's so cheap. It's just a cheap method. So I think that it's it's continuous. But I think ransomware is by far the fastest growth that we see. 
And you know, just so to remind you on, on the ransomware that, that meant that file can basically encrypt your data. And then you get this then you get this note that if you uh, pay through PayPal or some other systems through Bitcoins nowadays a lot, uh, if you pay, uh, I would send you a code <coughs> and then it opens up your system. Some of the, uh, we see three versions of them. Somewhere, actually, the ransomware is not very good, so the encryption is not very good, so it's actually more fake. You just get the screen and some people pay, right? It doesn't really do anything. And then we have the, the second option where they encrypt heavily, you can't break it, and they don't send you the key, even if you pay. And then we have the honest criminals who actually, they do send you the key, and they actually even have a support page where you can go and ask them if you can know how to install the key. So you know they they, have, they feel that they are helping their consumers and customers. This is an interesting one. Yeah, so spam is on. Sorry there was some time. Yeah, I was just wanted to ask about Linux users. Could you list some specific security risks for Linux users? Well unless you install some specific servers of course. I think all the on all the cases, for example, if you look at it, I think one of, there, there, are many, there are many ways of doing it. One is, of course, that you don't have any security systems on. That's, a, that's an easy one. The second thing is that uh, you, you can use, you, you need to up, I mean, the, the most easy, I'll give you an example. The easiest way to get through is to use old versions of any of the software that you have. So if you don't do the software patches, then you're open wider. So basically, it means that that if you don't do your software patches, I can run now a scan. If I would have your, for example, yeah, I could run a scan into your machines, and I'll get all the versions of all the software that you have. And then if I'm a hacker, I just put the list and compare it with any of the old versions of Adobe or whatever, and I can see that hey, these versions are full of holes. The new version has fixed it. So then I just know that those guys who have that old version, are, you know, just walk in. Like high, high, that's. So I think those are the most common, the most easy way that you should use. And then, then I think the third one is do a backup. So I say, do a backup. Do a backup. Like don't connect it to, you know, don't get home. You know, put it on other PC and then they connect it. If I'm, out, if I'm a ransomware guy, I will get to your cloud. I'll get to anything that connects so that everything is encrypted. So it doesn't help to have a backup. And then I think uh, I would do those checks that I said, you know, go to our privacy page, go to our checker, router checker, so then you see that, who's, that nobody's running anything around those devices. Those are a few very simple things that you can do, right, uh, to run. And then I would say finally, don't use one, two, three, four as a mask people. Yeah, but what about some specific scanners or systems which uh, yeah, we have, of course, we do that a lot with the companies. So then you have very, very sophisticated tools to go and check the level. And actually, our our company systems, for example, lifts automatically all your software to the right level. So as a user, you don't have to do it anymore. It just upgrades everything. So there are many methods, uh, but then, you know, you're not going to get them free on it. There are many ways of checking and running, and we get it. we get a lot of people coming to our labs. Also, uh, companies come to our labs. For example, poker players on the net. Many times when they start losing money, they you know then they realize they have somebody be watching what they have. An easy way to make money on the internet. One down. Yeah. I want to ask about browsers. Uh, what is your idea about this? Project and browsers, which is... Yeah, I think browsers are used a lot, uh, and uh, we of course have millions of pages which we block, and that lives all the day, or every day, because there are many ways from web pages or browsers which are used as well maliciously. I think those are part of most of, of the good antivirus or, or the internet, internet security companies have those capabilities to use safe browsers, and then not to be steered into wrong pages. Right? 
project for Thor. Yeah. Well, I think that Thor. Yeah, I think uh, at least when I look at the, as we understand, when we look at the NSA documentation, for example, which Snowden revealed, they had hacked the Thor a long time ago already, for example. So can't just count on that either. I think you need. My final point would be that you need to, you know, to be to be safe on your traffic, you need to have good security in your devices, you do backups, and you must have encryption capabilities. If your data is not encrypted when it runs around, you're wide open basically, because somebody will get through somewhere. And and uh, so I think encryption is a, is a big issue. Encrypt, you know, that's what companies do now. They encrypt the traffic, VPNs, they encrypt the devices, what they have, and it's a very easy way. Actually. If it very, it's, it's impossible to open when you have strong encryption codes and, and methods. So, and, and I, I would advise encryption a lot. And we do that if you look at Freedom product, for example. It encrypts your data. So even if somebody hacks you when you use a free Wi-Fi, it doesn't matter for you. They're not going to open it up. So those are a few simple ways to do it. It's not only our product, but there are others as well when you use them. So it makes your life a lot easier. So many in here uh, have uh, thought to have, have had a cryptography course. Many actually have taught crypto cryptography courses here. How much different is the life of a specialist in your company, a company like yours, compared with uh, what is it taught in a... Uh, yeah, I think cryptographs, uh, wow, it's a good job. And, and working with uh, security in the labs in high demand. So if you look at from, uh, you know, uh, I think from we're all looking for those high skills. High skills in that. And you're right that they change, they evolve, but that's like everything in technology. Uh, in a way, your capabilities, you need to evolve them all the time. But I think that's part of it. When new tools come out, new cryptograph, graphic keys come out, uh, new methods come out, right? So, if I understood the question right. So, is it that your specialists really are on this level, or is it well, there are other level networks and then? Uh, yeah, we have uh, we have our own cryptographic libraries. So we have people with cryptographic skills, yes, but they typically have other skills as well. So we have uh, end we have endpoint skills. Uh, we have network skills. We have, you know, system. There's many different. We have architecture. So there are many different kinds of skill sets that you have. For it. And, and uh, some, if I look at some people in the labs, they are more system level. Some go very deep. Some, uh, with more and more, we get requests nowadays to do in-depth forensics. So basically, something has happened. Something has hit your windshield, and, and you need somebody to. And the typical question for us is, you know, what happened? And who did it? And uh, that those, you know, who and why? Those are kind of the, maybe the three main questions that we go in when something has happened. And, uh, and then it's typically a big panic. A lot of managers riding around wondering what the heck happened, what are we going to do, how do you save the company? And, and uh, it goes from everything is no big issue to actually why big panic everybody running around. And suddenly the price tag goes up, and then, then you want the best of the best of the world to come and try to save you and your company. In the worst case, can I lose? Okay. So that's where I think, from our point of view, people of those skills are very high demand. It's a good place to be. The fighting like crazy to give them. <coughs> those are the people that are, are uh, uh, yeah, we send them out to companies, then they do forensics. It's a deep skill, very deep. You don't want an average guy in there. Only. And we have uh, over 20 nationalities just in our offices here in Helsinki. In the headquarters, over 20 nationalities. So it tells you that, for example, we, we, we just need to recruit for wherever we find the best of skill sets. And they come there because they have the best of skill sets, so they can develop themselves. Right? They want to work with the best of the world. It's a nice. Nice uh, spin when you get it right. An awful spin when you get it wrong. Ah, yeah. um, 
in your opinion, where is this uh, red line uh, between the surveillance and the privacy violation for good and bad? I think it's uh, the legislation drives a lot in terms of. I think that the the for example, what NSA did was they went over the edge far too far. I think they did what technologically was possible, but they went way too far when you look at it, right? They basically made it to a surveillance state. It's like a horrible group right that we thought was not even possible. So that's that's crossing the line quite far. And we, what we do is that we, we, from our point of view, what's crossing the line is very simple from, from a commercial company. What we have done is, and we stated it publicly on websites. Number one, we do not condone, we are not going to be part of mass surveillance. Which means that you do not have a court order, you do not go after a certain case or criminal or whatever investigation, but you actually just gather all of the data just in case. You turn the court system upside down. We don't approve of that. We don't. We will not give our encryption keys out, and we will not build back doors into any of our systems or software or any of the kind. And we will do checks on our people that there is no misuse of any. So you can't walk into our systems and be there. So if, you, if your customer allows you, know you say. And then what we do is that when you come with a court order and you want somebody who is under investigation and has the court order, which we are under the Finnish law, then of course we will help and open up when it is to that specific individual organization that you're investigating. So I think that's how we draw the line and how we think the company should go. We're not, we don't want to protect criminals, but of course we are there to protect the consumer businesses. And if you kind of break those three that I said, it's very hard to do that in an ethical way. You ended your talk with uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah. And uh, my question is with respect to this example of yours. So obviously, would like to track abnormal abnormalities happening on your device. To do this, you need to track the user and when it's abnormally used. And the only way, or the only concept I know of this device on uh, could you elaborate on how you plan to do this? I mean, you need to gather the data and the user experience sure. from the user uses the device, meaning that you would become the kind of, you would make the user a product, if you will. Or there is a risk that you could do. Sure, and I think this is a, by the way, did you get a question, everybody? So the que I think it's a very good question, very relevant as well, if you understand King. So artificial intelligence, to be able to do that, or exactly correct, to do forensics, you need to have something of historical data to do forensics on. If there is no data, there is no forensics. If there is no history, you can you can only look forward. And of course, by the way, all the criminals and state governments are of course trying to delete and destroy any trace that they have. Some of our explained to you the region which actually destroys itself. Now when it comes to this, what we've done is all of our products, we have stated what we gather, which is absolute minimum of information, we even state there is no way, we don't, if, for example, for freedom, we don't even know who the user is, right? We have gone so far with some of our products that we don't know, so it doesn't, it's no point coming to us and telling, we want to follow this person and see, there's no historical data we can give away, right? So we are very, very rigid on that, very clear, and we're very transparent. Now, when it comes to artificial intelligence, actually, the automated tools, we would use it our view at the moment is, now we haven't even thought about consumers, if we would do it in any way with consumers, we would just help. At the moment, corporations are in a situation where they very, very much are under attack. So what we would do it, where we are using it now first is, then we agree with the company that this information needs to be gathered. Now we can gather it in your premises, so we don't even have access to it, but it gathers there in the safe side, and if needed, we can come in with forensic capabilities and afterwards find out what happened, who did it, and where it happened. The other way is that we actually gather that information into us, into our cloud, which is very secure, of course, and then we have a responsibility for that. So but that's, a, that's a, at the moment, we're looking at that from a corporation. 
so we use the companies, but then it's a mutual, mutual agreement on how we do it. So I think that's a very relevant question. I, I like it. That's how we try to do it. It's a mutual contract. We can even leave it and with the corporation. All right, hey, good questions and good reading. I like that, so thanks a lot. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it.